Um, once again, if you're visiting us this morning, you're very welcome. And uh, today we're looking, uh, we're going through a book in the New Testament called Hebrews. And it's called that because it was written as a letter to um, people who are of Jewish or Hebrew heritage, but they had become believers in Jesus. And we think it was written about 68 AD. Um, and even though that's a really long time ago, we think there are still things in this letter that are relevant to us today. And um, before we read our passage, I thought I would give you some backstory, because if you are new here today, and I just read the passage, um, it's not going to have a whole lot of context for you. Um, so I thought I'd do a little bit of that, and then when I read the passage, I'm hoping that will make a bit more sense to you. So to give you a really brief overview of some of the New Testament, um, thanks to Andrew Lloyd Webber, you may have heard of Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat, and uh, he was a guy from the book of Genesis, who was sold out by his brothers um, into slavery in Egypt uh, because they were jealous of him. But what happened was God took what was difficult in his life and he worked it for good. And then Joseph became one of the most prominent people in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. And what happened, there was a, a famine and um, God used Joseph to save the people from this famine, and lots of the Israelite people, including his own family, came to Egypt uh, for food and to be saved from the famine, and they settled there. And the Israelite people became more and more numerous and prosperous in Egypt. And um, then F Joseph died, and that pharaoh died, and then another pharaoh came to power who didn't really care about Joseph, but he did care about how many Israelite people were in Egypt and how numerous and influential they were. So he took them into slavery, and that lasted 400 years. And then God raised up another guy, a Hebrew guy, but who had been raised in the Egyptian household, the royal household, and that was Moses. And... Um, and Moses went to Pharaoh and he said, let my people go out of slavery. And Pharaoh said, no. And he said, okay, God's going to send a series of plagues on Egypt, which he did. And Pharaoh still said no. And then uh, Moses said, okay, an angel is going to come and going to strike the firstborn dead of every household. Uh, but to the Israelite people, God said, if you, um, an angel is going to come and pass over. But if you take a lamb and make a special Passover meal... And you take some of the blood from that lamb and you put it on your doorpost. This angel will pass over your household and you'll be spared. And this is exactly what happened. And the firstborn from all the other Egyptian households was killed, including Pharaoh's own son. And so then Pharaoh finally says, okay, take your people and go. And they flee out through the desert, and they get to the Red Sea. They're being pursued by Pharaoh's army because Pharaoh suddenly realized he's let go all his pyramid-building workforce. And then um, they get to the Red Sea. God opens the Red Sea. They walk through on dry land, and they're saved. They're free. God has set his people free. And they get into the desert, and God provides for them everything they need. He gives them manna, which is like bread. He gives them quail, water. Their clothes don't wear out. It's miraculous, these ways that he's providing for them. But even after a few days, they start complaining, and they're like, I don't want to eat the same thing every day. I don't want to wear the same thing every day. It's kind of pathetic. And then uh, they even make a golden calf, and they worship it, and they say it was this calf that brought us out of Egypt. Very not cool. Um, so they were camped at Mount Sinai and God called Moses and said, come up and be with me on the mountain. And uh, despite their lack of gratitude, God still says about these people, you're my treasured possession. You know, you're my people. And he gives Moses, he says, tell the people there's two systems for living. He gives them the law, just a series of laws, and a system of worship which involved sacrifice. And he says, I'm God. I'm holy and perfect. I know you're not going to be able to keep the law because even after a few days, you're whinging about the food. So how's it going to be, you know, for with everything else? And um, so here's a means by which you can be right with me. We can be in right relationship with each other by a means of sacrifice for the things that you do wrong. And a priest from a special family will offer those sacrifices on your behalf, a perfect lamb without blemish in the tabernacle, which was like a tent of worship. Once a year, 
on the Day of Atonement. Okay, so that's our backstory. They were people with laws and sacrifices offered by a priest on behalf of those people when the laws were broken. And in this book of Hebrews, the writer is making a case that we now have a better priest who is Jesus. Okay? So now, here's our passage. This passage in chapter 8 is called The High Priest of a New Covenant. And it says, now the main point of what we're saying is this, we do have such a high priest, Jesus, who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to make the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now, there's actually more of this passage to come, but let's stop there for a minute and look at some of the key things from here, including the word obsolete. Now, it's not a half-hearted word, is it? Some things, you can't say something's kind of obsolete, like either something is outdated and no longer useful and defunct, or it isn't. And it's not really a complimentary word either, is it? You wouldn't say, oh, that is so obsolete. <laughs> you wouldn't say that, would you? Now, just to digress for a minute, a couple of years back, Miles and I did this strengths test thing. That is so hard to say, strengths test, right? And um, you kind of think you know what your strengths are, right? And then when my results came back, it said that one of my top things was input. And I was like, what even is that? Like, how, how is that a strength? Like, <laughs> and uh, the little blurb, you know, that went with it said, you know, this is you love resource, you love information, and you love to order and archive information and things like that. And I thought, that is freakishly accurate. <laughs> um, because if you come to my house, we have hundreds of books and CDs and um, also the many, many concerts that we go to to see our son play. We, I have the programs. I have the tickets. I have everything because one day when I get a spare five minutes, I'm going to make that photo book of the year and it's going to be a completely accurate record of everything that happened, right? That's just, I don't know why I need to do that, but I do. Now, some people call that hoarding and I'm going to call it archiving, okay? <laughs> now, I know that I'm not a hoarder because there's this other side of my personality that is completely in conflict with this, that wants to declutter everything, okay? This isn't working. So, um, and here, my visual aid. I think I'm doing really well with decluttering until I get to this. It's a box of cassettes, okay? And once a year, I, I, you know, I go into my wardrobe and on a high shelf is this box and I get it out and I open the lid and I go, 
hmm, I like that. And Miles appears over my shoulder and he goes, chuck it. <laughs> chuck it. He goes, and I go, hmm. I don't know. And the lid goes back on and it goes back on the shelf, right? And, um, but there's all kinds of things in here. Look, the police. Um, I've got Billie Holiday, 16 classic tracks. I've got Mariah Carey, <laughs> even. And, uh, but this is the soundtrack to my school years, right? Yeah, and can I just throw that away? Like, Miles, do you really want me to throw that away? And um, so the declutterer in me, wants to, wants to throw that away. But the archivist in me says, this is my history, right? (laughs) I'm getting there. I'm getting there, Scott. But um, hey, so I'm talking about cassette tapes, right? Have a little drink. There's some good stuff in there, I'm telling you. So I'm talking about cassette tapes. But for the people getting this letter, they're Jewish people who had become Christians. And this writer is saying to them, your whole previous way of life, everything you have ever known up till now, your culture, your heritage, your traditions, your way of worshipping, your entire identity, and the identity of people that you are still related to and connected to, It's obsolete. Like, that's a shocking thing to say, isn't it? And this, um, they would have been, excuse me, you know, like offended. They would have been offended by that. But this writer, he spends three whole chapters, 8, 9, and 10, telling them why this new order is better. And the writer, he's working really hard to convince them because they need a complete shift in their minds and in their hearts from one culture or order to another. Because you can't live as those waiting for a Messiah and also believe that the Messiah has come. You, you can't do both of those things at the same time. Now, there were some very practical reasons why they may have been keeping up those traditions um, At this time, the Jewish faith was recognized by the Roman Empire as like an official religion, but Christianity was not. And 64 AD, Emperor Nero came to power, and he used to find it amusing to blame the Christians for anything that went wrong in the city. He would crucify them. He would set them on fire and light his garden parties with them. He would throw them to the lions in the great arenas to amuse the crowds. We know historically that these things happened. Um, So for these believers to identify solely with Jesus without the protection of the state was literally for them to risk their lives. So what are the deal clinches in this passage? Um, The first thing is that this new order is built on better promises. Now, in the verses that talk about covenant and God writing on people's hearts, the writer is actually quoting a prophecy in Jeremiah 31. But he's saying this is not something God is still going to do in the future. It has now been fulfilled in Jesus. Now, Phil Moore says that now Jesus has come. His new covenant enables us to be baptized with the Holy Spirit And it therefore changes everything about the way in which we can worship God. The Spirit enables us to relate more intimately with God. Before, there was external rules. There was the Ten Commandments and many other rules and regulations written on tablets of stone. But now God says, I want to write this on your heart. We're motivated by life in the Spirit to live God's way because we want to, not because we have to. And a list of external rules, it's got no power to change anyone's life. But now if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're changed from the inside out. You're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You know, it's like the old way is like you mess up, you offer a sacrifice. You mess up, you offer a sacrifice. It's like an ongoing, continuous thing. You know, to put it in a monetary analogy, it's like you go to work, you pay bills, 
you go to work, you pay bills. It's like there's no way to get out of that hamster treadmill thing. But now it's as though you've been left a massive inheritance by great aunt Patricia. You know, now you never have to set foot in that office or worry about money ever again. You know, it's like the cycle is broken You're not chained to it anymore. Just as we sang this morning, Jesus has paid our debts once and for all. It was for freedom that Jesus set us free. It's completely different. It's it's not a different version of the old way. It's a whole different life. And this is what this writer wants these believers and us to see. Like there's new life in Christ. It's not a new version of the old you you are a new creation, you have a new nature, it's brand new, everything is brand new life. Now what is surprising about this passage is that if the old way of worship in the tabernacle is obsolete, why go on to talk about it in detail? Because our passage goes on to describe worship in the earthly tabernacle. And it says, now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room with a lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread, this was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place or the holy of holies, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold coven ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold ark of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover or mercy seat. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on the ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that was only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices were being offered and not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. So if the old is obsolete, and I just realized I forgot to say, this is obsolete. This was the whole point I was making. This is obsolete technology, right? It's obsolete, but it's hard to let go of the obsolete sometimes because we have emotional attachments to it. But if the old is obsolete and there's a new order, why does this stuff matter now? Like, why do we need to concern ourselves with the detail of these tabernacle things now? And I think what we're supposed to take from this is that everything described here is pointing to Jesus. Everything is symbolic. And probably the priests and the people of this time, they wouldn't have even understood that symbolism. They were just being obedient to the instructions that God had given them. And apparently, and interesting, when they pitched their tents in the desert, they actually pitched them in the shape of a cross. And they they wouldn't have seen that shape. You know, there was no drone aerial photography uh, back then. And even if they had seen that shape, it wouldn't have had any significance for them because the cross was a means of execution by the Roman Empire, which didn't even exist then. But that shows us that God has got a far-reaching plan from eternity to eternity before time existed The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit decided that Jesus would come and live a perfect life and die on a cross in his humanity for the sins of the world. And in his humility, he would submit, eternal God would submit himself to death, trusting that the Father would raise him back to life by the Spirit, having conquered death for everyone who believes in him. So all these things in the tabernacle point to Christ. And I'm grateful to Kay Warren at Saddleback Church for her excellent study on these things. Now, I'll go through some of them. The lampstand represented Jesus, the light of the world. 
I don't know if you can see it down the front there, but it's, it's kind of shaped like this. It's got these. Now, it wasn't put together out of several pieces of gold. It was actually beaten out of one massive piece of gold. Uh, incredible craftsmanship to be able to do that. Now, Isaiah 53 describes how Jesus was crushed and beaten for our sins. And look at the shape of it. It's got this uh, trunk, if you like, and then all these branches coming out from it. John 15 says that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. We cannot bear fruit by ourselves, but only by remaining in him. The 12 loaves of consecrated bread represent the 12 tribes of Israel. But also in John 6, Jesus describes himself as the bread of life. He says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He said, my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The tables were made with wood overlaid with gold. This also represents Jesus. The wood represents him in his humanity, and the gold represents him as the glorified king. The altar of incense represents prayer. Psalm 141 says, May my prayer be set before you like incense. In Luke 18, Jesus used a story to teach his followers that they should always pray and never lose hope. Prayer is a key to our communion with God. And then we come to the most holy place towards the back, that large purple curtain at the back. The veil represented Jesus' body broken for us, the means by which we gain access to God. The torn veil signified that God had accepted the blood offering Jesus had provided and that Jesus' work was finished. Jesus is the new order. In the old system, a priest would lay his hands on a goat, literally called a scapegoat. And that goat would be led out out of the city far away, symbolically carrying away the sins of the people. Jesus says that on the cross, as far as the east is from the west, that is how far he has removed our sins from us. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is at one and the same time the high priest offering the sacrifice and the sacrifice that makes us acceptable to God. His ministry, our passage says, is superior. The curtain's been torn in two from top to bottom. Now we have access to God. Not one priest once a year, but we can have access to God every minute of every day. God and the presence of God has entered our everyday lives. And I would just like to draw two points from this. And the first is, don't lose the reverence. You know, when something's off limits, it's kind of more attractive. You know, if you're not allowed to go in somewhere... (laughs) then suddenly all you want to do is go in there, right? It's mysterious. It has mystique. But now that the curtain in the temple has come down and God's presence has entered the everyday, he's there in the office, the car park, the supermarket, the college campus. But we shouldn't confuse that with thinking that God has become ordinary or like us. He's still God who was willing to become like us in Jesus on the earth but yet is still completely other than us. A.W. Tozer once said, what the church most needs today is a restoration of the vision of the Most High God. God is willing to call us friends. It's amazing. He invites us to intimacy, which by nature involves informality. But we don't want to become so casual and informal about it that it loses value, that we take the privilege of access for granted. Matt Redmond reminds us to sing, may I never lose the wonder, the wonder of your mercy. And Matt Redmond also writes this, worship thrives on wonder. We can admire, appreciate, and perhaps even adore someone without a sense of wonder, but we cannot worship without wonder. I've come to love the word otherness. It's such a great worship word, a sense that God is so pure, matchless, and unique that no one else and nothing else even comes close. He is altogether glorious, unequaled in splendor, and unrivaled in power. 
He's beyond the grasp of human reason, far above the reach of even the loftiest scientific mind. Inexhaustible, immeasurable, and unfathomable. Eternal, immortal, and invisible. The highest mountain peaks and the deepest canyon depths are just tiny echoes of his proclaimed greatness. And the blazing stars above, only the faintest emblems of the full measure of his glory. Sometimes in the church, he says, I worry. We convey a tame and domesticated God and find ourselves stuck in the endless pursuit of the ordinary. But the call is to venture out into the ocean, to encounter the extraordinary and to explore the mighty depths of God. And though our earthly gathered worship times may never sound the depths of his glory, beware of those that don't even attempt to. And my final point is that we must take full advantage of full access. And um, I just want to say I'm so glad the songs that the band chose this morning, they really reflected a lot of what I'm saying here. But um, let me ask you a question. If you had an all-access pass to the All England Club, that's, that's the tennis club where they host Wimbledon every year. If you had an all-access pass to that club, and you could sit anywhere you wanted, would you go and sit yourself out in court 18? Or would you sit in the royal box on centre court? You can sit anywhere you want. You take the best seat in the house, right? Now, we know in our hearts, hopefully, we know in our heads for sure, that we have 24-7 full access to Almighty God, and yet sometimes... We're just content to hang around on the outer courts instead of pressing right in. You know, when we gather here, as we heard, as we experienced, as we sang this morning, God is here. I ask myself, am I able to be more excited and expectant about that than I currently am? Would he be here more powerfully than he currently is if we came with more faith? Could we be astounded each week by miracles and healings and salvations? God is able. Are we willing to ask and to wait? Are we hungry to know him more? Are we willing to pursue him? How much do we want him? God wants to dwell with us. Do you know that the word dwell and the word tabernacle mean the same thing? God wants access to all your decisions and life choices. He wants to walk alongside. He wants you to experience his presence in wonderful ways. He wants you to feel his comfort and strength and peace and grace in whatever you are going through. And in a very real and down-to-earth way, Kay Warren says this, God has actually given us all access to himself. God is a relational God, and he wants to be in relationship with you. He wants you to get to know him. He wants to be a part of your life in the high points. He wants to be a part of the low points, the times when you're feeling good, pretty good about who you've become. He wants to be part of your life when you're actually pretty ashamed at some of the things you've thought and said and done. He wants to be a part of the dreams that you have for your family. He wants to be a part of your doubts and your questions. He wants to get down there in the middle of the messiness and the complicated situations of your life. He wants to be there on the dark nights. He wants to be there during the successes, the births, the deaths, the marriages, the divorces, the evictions, the one-night stands. He wants to be around in the drunken stupors. He wants to be around in the terrible fights that you have in your home. He wants to be with you in the good times and the bad, the promotions and the trophies and the honors and the successes. God wants to be involved in your life. He wants to be at the center of the story of you because the story of you is really the story of you and God. I'm just going to pray. Lord, we thank you for access. 
We thank you that you have made it possible. You've allowed us to come near to you. Lord, what a great privilege that is, and we never want to take it for granted. Look, God, we don't want to hang around on the outer courts, but we want to press into you. We want to know you more. We want to know everything that you've made available for us to know about you, Lord. We want to see you moving in ways that we've not seen you move yet. We believe you can, God. And I pray, Lord God, you would draw our hearts this morning. And if you're, new, you're here today and you're thinking, I don't even really know who this God is, but I want to. I want him to be a part of my life. We would love to pray with you at the end. There'll be a ministry team that will come over here. And uh, we just say, Lord, Lord, we want to draw close to you, Lord. We want to take advantage of the access. We don't want to live Monday to Saturday just doing okay on our own, thanks. And then Sunday we come and sing a few songs to you, Lord. We want you to be in every part, every decision every moment.